Good evening and welcome to the show. I'm Shari Matson. Here's what's coming up. Pro-Palestinian protesters storm a Melbourne hotel where family members of those murdered or kidnapped were staying. The mother of a man killed by Hamas at the Supernova Festival was there and she'll join me later in the program. Labor ministers are lining up to accuse the opposition leader of protecting pedophiles. And now Peter Dutton is demanding Labor apologise. Matt Canavan, Jason, Morris, Jason Morrison, Bronwyn Bishop and Jenna Clark will be on the show to discuss. And Brittany Higgins slams his insulting, intense questioning over her state of undress as she's cross-examined on the fourth day of the Bruce Lerman defamation trial. The bombshell accusations that her evidence has been inconsistent is coming up. And lawyer Rebecca Giles will join me to discuss the revelations this week. But first tonight, to the storming of a Melbourne hotel by pro-Palestinian activists where the family members of Israeli hostages were staying. As you may know, there's been a group of family members of Israelis who were either kidnapped or murdered in the October 7 terror attacks here in Australia. The delegation came to Australia to raise awareness of the atrocities committed by Hamas on their loved ones to try and stop the anti-Semitism that we're seeing. And last night they were in Melbourne and someone at their hotel must have tipped off activists that they were staying there. The group returned home from a function to a vile and aggressive scene with protesters holding fake babies covered in blood. And this wasn't outside their hotel, it was inside. Have a look at this. The group of Israelis were forced to hide. They had to find protection at the local police station. And they're going to join me on the show a bit later to tell us what exactly went down. But make no mistake about it, this is disgraceful. What are these Palestinian activists actually protesting? They can't seriously be protesting the families who've had their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, their children, their friends kidnapped or murdered. But they are. It's incomprehensible. These are people who have gone through immeasurable suffering and tragedy and they've bravely decided to share their story with Australians so that we all understand what's happening in Israel, what sparked this war. Well, opposition leader Peter Dutton said the mob should have been arrested for anti-Semitic hate speech. He said in a statement that they were clearly intended to intimidate those Israelis whose loved ones have been killed or taken hostage by Hamas. He says these actions threatened Australians of Jewish faith. Only by holding these, those accountable for hate speech can we ensure we turn the tide of anti-Semitism in Australia, which has increased fivefold since the 7th of October. Dutton said there has to be severe consequences for, protests, for protesters who commit anti-Semitic acts. He says law enforcement authorities should have arrested those protesters. And then in question time today, both Dutton and the Prime Minister condemned this protest. We are a successful multicultural nation. There is no place in this country to try to bring a conflict in that sort of way through that sort of action here in Australia. It is an act of depravity and it is an act that rightly is condemned and I hope that these organisers and those who are responsible and others who are like-minded hear a very definite voice from this parliament, from the Prime Minister, from myself, from all members, that we condemn those actions. The Victorian Premier Jacinta Allen said it was outrageous to re-traumatise people and the Victorian Police Commissioner said the behaviour was appalling. I condemn the extreme behaviour that was on display last night in the strongest possible terms. I condemn anti-Semitism in the strongest possible terms. And I condemn the act of targeting people in their unique moment of grief. Police will go about their business to keep people safe and to uphold the law. 
but there are always going to be people who think it's somehow appropriate to operate in the grey uh, to intimidate uh, and to stress people and it's just not on. These comments are obviously supportive, but why didn't the police stop this protest? Why didn't they arrest people as Dutton said they should have? A distinction has to be drawn between lawful protests in the city, in a neutral place, and these anti-Semitic protests that we've seen take place outside a synagogue, shutting down the synagogue service, in Jewish suburbs, and now at the hotel where family members of those killed or kidnapped were staying. As Dutton said, this was clearly targeting Jews and the people involved should have been arrested for hate speech. Zionist Federation President Jeremy Liebler put it perfectly when he said that there's support for the Palestinian cause and then there's this vile, cruel intimidation of people whose loved ones have been kidnapped by rapists, murderers and torturers. He said it's absolutely disgusting that anyone would seek to intimidate these relatives who are already suffering the trauma of having their family members kidnapped or murdered. He said these protesters need to take a long look in the mirror and ask why they're supporting a terrorist regime. Now, these families have left Melbourne. They're in Sydney today, and some of them will join me a bit later on the show to talk about how intimidating that situation was. I bet they never expected to be treated like this in Australia. And then there's the unfolding situation at the Sydney Theatre Company. After three actors, including Hugo Weaving's son, Harry Greenwood, took to the stage wearing the kefir, that's the chequered Palestinian scarf, during the production of The Seagull on Saturday night. They said online that their protest was to condemn occupation and genocide of Gaza. Well, today, the chief executive of Carla Zampatti Fashion House, the son of the late Carla Zampatti, Alex Schumann, resigned from the board of the Sydney Theatre Company. And this is the second resignation now from the high-powered board. After Judy Houseman quit after 15 years on the board, she said she was devastated by the handling of this stunt by the actors. The Sydney Theatre Company yesterday ordered the actors to keep their politics away from the stage. They said in a statement that they recognise that when audiences attend a production, they come to experience the content in that play and that play only, and that any exception to this needs to be done in consultation with the company and consideration of their duty of care. Duty of care. But then just with an hour before its start time, last night's production was cancelled. People were said to be already sitting in their seats. The Sydney Theatre Company just made this statement today, saying they made the decision to cancel the performance at short notice from a duty of care perspective. They said, we understand that this caused a significant inconvenience to many audience members and we apologise. Well, we don't know the full story yet, but you can only presume the actors were intending on protesting against Israel once again, refusing to listen to the Sydney Theatre Company production. And this is also a problem in schools. We've brought you the news this week on this program that teachers are wearing the kefir and the Palestinian pin to school. Some are even putting up posters about Gaza around the school grounds. And teachers are being told that if their principal has an issue with it, they should tell their principal to speak to the teachers' union. This is defying their school principals. The education department has reminded teachers of their code of conduct, even sending an official to speak to one school in New South Wales on Tuesday but it just doesn't appear to be working. Now, we broke this story on the show on Tuesday night. The Education Minister in New South Wales, Prue Carr, finally spoke about it today in question time. She warned teachers that they will be dealt with under the Code of Conduct. This week, the Teachers' Federation encouraged teachers to defy the Education Department's Code of Conduct by wearing the Palestinian kafia and even taking protest signs into the classrooms. What action will you take to stop the Teachers' Federation from encouraging the Code of Conduct breach and the politicisation of our classrooms? Well, I'm very disappointed with the Teachers' Federation in this instance. I've made that very clear. Uh, we do not want classes, classrooms, 
uh, to be places where political activity takes place. That is not what schools are there for. We cannot have any actions that provoke unrest, discomfort, or make other students or other teachers feel unsafe or unwelcome. Uh, that has no place in any schools, and when it comes to my responsibility in public schools, it is not appropriate to make a child feel uncomfortable or unwelcome or another member of staff, for instance. I have made my uh, expectation very clear about the code of conduct and that people will be uh, dealt with in accordance with the code of conduct if they, if they breach that. So very clear comments there, although a couple of days late, from the Education Minister in New South Wales, Pru Khan, that question by Kelly Sloan. But the pro-Palestinian teachers are now furious that they can't indoctrinate their students against Israel. One teacher went on a rant in a piece published by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age about why she should be able to teach her students about what she calls Israeli aggression. It's almost shocking to read this. This is Farah Kayrat. She's a high school teacher in southeast Melbourne. And she says the teachers at her school received an email from management telling them not to speak to students about the conflict in the Middle East. Farah writes, and I quote, What does this email say about our duty to the thousands of children and dozens of teachers and school staff killed in Gaza? to the one Palestinian child killed every 10 minutes earlier this month, as the head of the World Health Organization reported. She writes, how can I ignore the countless images and videos on social media of children's bodies covered with dirt, rubble and blood? I have seen footage of a young girl identifying her mother's corpse, of a man holding and gently kissing the forehead of his five-year-old granddaughter's lifeless body, pigtails still intact. She says, alongside what I hope to be a growing number of teachers, I refuse to stay silent. Do you hear that? I refuse to stay silent because trying to sweep this under the rug is just another form of oppression. To be silent is to be complicit. She says, we can't as educators continue to teach our students to be upstanders and in the same breath be silent to the mass killing and displacement broadcasted to us. This is just... This is breathtaking. Can you imagine having a teacher in the classroom speaking about Israel like this? Uh, how would that make Jewish students feel? Well, it would make them feel threatened, isolated, alienated and bullied. This teacher, Farah, right there in black and white, she said she refuses to stay silent. So we can assume that despite what we just heard from Prukar, despite what we hear from the education department, we can assume that some teachers are ignoring their own code of conduct that insists they remain impartial. The teachers sign up to this code of conduct. The code of conduct says they have to stay impartial, they have to keep politics away from the classroom. Well, they're just ignoring this. The Shadow Education Minister in New South Wales, Sarah Mitchell, already said this week that Jewish students are being bullied at school. Now, this situation with teachers taking their anger towards Israel into the classroom is going to make matters even worse. It's going to make anti-Semitism and bullying of Jewish children even worse. Children who might not even know there's a war going on, by the way. If this teacher wants to have an honest discussion with students, she would have to mention that Israel is trying to eradicate the terrorist group Hamas that governs Gaza in a war that was unprovoked. But she doesn't mention this because it seems that educators of the next generation aren't that interested in the facts. Now, this teacher Farah doesn't spare a thought for Israeli hostages or the Jews who were killed in the most barbaric fashion known to mankind on October the 7th. No mention in that piece of the Jewish lives lost, of the Jewish babies burnt and killed, of the pregnant mother who had her unborn child cut out from her stomach. No mention of the execution room, of the teenage girls raped and murdered or dragged through the streets. No mention of them. No mention of the fact that the devastating loss of life of Palestinian civilians and Palestinian children is thanks to Hamas refusing to let them evacuate and also using them as human shields. This teacher, Farah, should be very clear. 
Hamas knew Israel would be forced to respond when it took the unprecedented terrorist action of kidnapping 240 innocent hostages and slaughtering 1,200 innocent Israelis. This wasn't a spontaneous attack. It was at least a year in the making. And as we speak, there are still 159 hostages in Gaza. Hamas doesn't have all of them, doesn't know where they all are. Many are in unknown locations, in underground tunnels or squirrelled away by another terrorist group, likely lice-riddled and without enough food. One of the families who's held hostage that we've been speaking about for weeks now is baby Kafir, his four-year-old brother Ariel and their parents. They were abducted in a terrifying fashion that you can see on the screen now on October 7, abducted by Hamas. You can see the fear in Shira, the mother's face. At first, they were believed to have been held by Hamas, and Hamas didn't disavow Israel of this impression. And just two days ago, Israeli authorities thought that baby Kafir and his brother and the mum, Shira, were going to be on the list set for the next release. But then Hamas claimed that they'd farmed the family off to another terrorist group in southern Gaza. They didn't say which group. But now overnight, they changed their story and we woke up this morning to, if we can call it news, the devastating claim that the family have been killed, Hamas says, by Israeli bombing. We can't believe anything Hamas says. We don't know if they're dead, alive, lost or in the control of a rival terror faction. But one thing's for certain, it's not looking hopeful for these innocent boys, 10 months old, kidnapped at nine months old, and Ariel, just four years old, and their parents. We're thinking of them and keeping them in our hearts. Associate Editor of The Australian, Jenna Clark, and National Senator Matt Canavan join me now. Welcome to you both. Matt, what is your reaction to these pro-Palestinian protests in Melbourne last night that really targeted the families of those hostages who were, were taken hostage or people who've been murdered, you know, people who are already suffering so deeply? Well, it was hard to believe that um, some of the uh, uh, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas in this case, uh, protesters could go any lower after what we saw at the Opera House uh, uh, when this all started a few weeks ago. But this is really a new low, I think, to confront uh, uh, affected family members uh, of uh, people that have been um, uh, captured, uh, maimed, uh, uh, brutally treated by a terrorist organisation. It's just totally beyond the pale. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what laws can be applied here. Uh, but uh, the full force of the law should be applied if possible. It shouldn't be right to intimidate people uh, like this. And I'm just kind of sick and tired of uh, these groups dividing our country in this sort of way. Uh, there are ways that you can appropriately protest on political issues, even ones I don't agree with in mm -hmm. this country. Uh, but uh, this particular group or groups associated with these pro-Hamas forces have violated uh, those rights so often uh, that they then, they then also threaten the rest of us having those rights because uh, one of the way our societies work is that we do respect each other, we respect each other's free speech, uh, but we don't do, do act in a way like this. It's absolutely reprehensible. Yeah. Jen, it feels like none of the authorities are actually able to get a handle on what's going on. You know, we talk the day after about why didn't police arrest p those protesters. I mean, we're still saying that. Shouldn't the lessons have been learnt already after the mm. Opera House? Mm. And then you've got, you know, the Education Department and the Education Minister saying follow the Code of Conduct and teachers are so emboldened that they write a piece in the City Morning Herald and The Age saying, we won't stay silent. They, they're mm. so intent on indoctrinating students to their view to think Israel is the enemy. What hope do we have for any um, improvement in anti-Semitism if this is what teachers want to teach their students? 
I think, Sherry, this falls completely and squarely at the foot of our leaders. And I think what we saw in Melbourne overnight, you really have to say some of the responsibility lies probably within the green political movement. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I didn't think we could get any lower than seeing high school students or Australian school students protesting, leaving school and protesting uh, around this uh, conflict in Gaza last week. And then we see Senator Maureen Faruqi standing in front of a sign, basically with a, a sign that a student was holding, saying that, you know, um, Israel, Israelis are trash. She had no problems putting that on her social media. It wasn't until she was called out that she deleted it. So the fact that we have an absolute lack of leadership in this country about this issue, it, it, I'm, I'm with you. I'm completely bereft. Mm. Look to another story today. The Daily Telegraph, uh, James Morrow, reveals that multiple departments are racking up quite large bills for acknowledgement to country training. Uh, James reports that taxpayers have paid around $100,000 to bring in consultants to help public servants better perform these gestures. Uh, Matt Canavan, do you think this is money well spent? Um, is that a rhetorical question, yeah. <laughs> Shari? I mean, uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I the, the speaking of new lows, I mean, the, the, the government already wasted over four hundred million dollars on a referendum that divided the country, mm. and now they're wasting more of your money, uh, uh, albeit and ho thankfully not as much, but they're just still a waste of money here. And so, so much money gets wasted here in this town in Canberra. It is so mm. frustrating while people are struggling to pay their own bills that there's no discipline being applied on the spending of government's budgets. And uh, ironically, uh, that is one of the reasons you're suffering or people are suffering uh, mm. in this country right now is because government spending has been out of control in this government. They boosted the budget a few months ago by the biggest increase in non-COVID years since Kevin Rudd. Uh, and uh, it's no surprise, given they seem to lack complete discipline over departmental spending when you see things like this. Yeah. Look, on another topic, uh, the Victorian Allen government is now open to the possibility of legalising recreational cannabis. Uh, the Premier Jacinta Allen made a confession when she was speaking about this that she has smoked cannabis. Have a look. It was a long, long time ago, a long, long, long time ago. And uh, I think it's important that we inject a sense of honesty into our contributions on this. I suppose I should declare I have used uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, uh, a criminal, criminal uh, approach to this is best. A health-based approach should be best. Yes. That university, yeah, I tried it, I think it was three times. I'm not proud of it, but I, I tried it. Jenna, we're seeing this move towards legalising drugs, particularly in the ACT, where they're legalising harder drugs like mm. ice. Uh, do you think this is going to act as a deterrent for teenagers or do you think legalising it might invite them or might give them the impression that it's actually OK to use these sort of substances? Yeah, I think the legislation is a really tricky one, Cherry, because I know that the majority of state and territory governments are looking at it, albeit in very in various degrees of legality and things like that. But I think uh, the responsibility of moving this de this debate forward really lies with us in the media, and I think we really need to move past this whole you know wowser movement of like asking our politicians, "Have you ever done dope?" Because I'm pretty sure we'd be pretty hard pressed in this day and age that the majority of our boomer and millennial MPs these days probably haven't experimented with cannabis at one point or the other. And I don't mean to be glib about it because, of course, it is an illicit substance. But I think we need to move this forward. And, and like Tim Pallas was just saying, maybe move this more towards a health issue uh, as opposed to a law and order issue. Yeah. Well, speaking of illicit substances, Matt Canavan, the federal government is banning the importation of vapes, which the Daily Mail reports will turn one million Australians into criminals. But at the same time, as I just mentioned, the ACT is decriminalising drugs like ICE. What do you think of this inconsistency? Well, it's just absurd, the situation, especially here in the ACT, where uh, if you are caught with liquid nicotine, uh, you face a $32,000 fine and or, or potentially a two years in jail uh, as a maximum penalty. Whereas if you're caught with cocaine, meth uh, or heroin, it's $100. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, what is the world going to here? And uh, the Daily Mail's right, over 1.3 million Australians do vape uh, now. I, I think the government's got no chance of putting this genie back in the bottle, whatever you think of vaping. Their attempt to ban it is only going to force those Australians into a black market, which will be a massive boon for bikey gangs and, <laughs> and tri triads all around the country. They will be laughing to the bank. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, we'll do not enough to keep vapes out of schools. That's what the focus should be on. Our enforcement efforts should be on keeping these things out of the hands of school children. I'll be introducing some amendments next week to the 
government's tobacco legislation mm. uh, to, to create a legalised, regulated vaping market and sell and look, treat it like cigarettes. That's how where we should go, just like the rest of the world's gone. And as I say, focus our efforts on schools and cracking down the black market. Mm. Well, I think part of the reason people are turning to vapes is I hear that cigarettes are now about $60 a packet, so people who want to smoke are, you know, moving to mm. other cheaper forms. Matt Canavan, Jenna Clark, thank you both so much for your time. Now, coming up, Brittany Higgins grilled on inconsistencies in the Bruce Lerman defamation trial today. We'll get the latest with high-profile lawyer Rebecca Giles. That's after this break. Well, Brittany Higgins has defended herself during cross-examination on the fourth day of the Bruce Lerman defamation trial against Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson. Higgins was grilled by Lerman's barrister about just how undressed she was. Was she naked or was her dress around her waist? She labelled this line of questioning insulting. Lerman's barrister Stephen Wybrow asked Higgins about the state that she woke up in after the alleged rape. He claimed it was a significant matter because it was immediately after the alleged sexual assault. He said to her, Miss Higgins, you understand that I'm asserting that, that that is a fabrication that you were sexually assaulted, don't you? And Higgins replied, I understand that that is your allegation. It's insulting, but I understand it. Wybrow claimed that Higgins made up the rape because she was worried about her job after she passed out while drunk in Linda Reynolds' office. Higgins responded by saying she would never do that and her job wasn't that important. But she admitted to lying about whether or not she'd visited a doctor after the night in question. She told her ex-boyfriend that she had gone to the doctor. She now claims she was placating him. She said she also regrets that she didn't go to the doctor. When Wybrow pushed her on this and said to her that the reason she hadn't visited the doctor was because she actually hadn't been raped, Higgins started crying and disagreed. She said she was alone in Canberra with no support. Channel 10's barrister Matthew Collins said he was concerned for her welfare and the judge called a 10-minute break. Higgins was also asked about that now-famous bruise on her leg. Higgins told the court that she'd edited the photograph, turning up the contrast to make the bruise clearer. But she said it may have been caused either by the alleged assault or tripping up the stairs. Wybrow said this was a different and inconsistent answer to the one she gave in her original statutory declaration. Higgins said that at the time she wrote the stat deck, she believed the bruise was caused by the alleged rape. She was also asked about a friendly email she'd sent to Bruce Lerman in the days following the alleged rape. She said in court today that the friendly tone was because she was in denial about the incident. Bruce Lerman has always maintained his innocence. Well, to speak about this dramatic day in court, let's bring in principal at Company Giles, Rebecca Giles. Thank you so much for your time. Rebecca, how has Bruce Lerman's credibility stood up to scrutiny this week? Well, Shari, I think it's fair to say that some of the fires he was intending on lighting haven't exactly fared so well after three days of cross-examination, where he's admitted to lying and, of course, lying about lying. I think anybody who has observed his evidence would agree that he's clearly an intelligent person. His, his answers were very careful and very highly qualified at times. Um, but I think that what struck me about his evidence, that his degree of recollection varied wildly. So on some aspects, he was really particular and on others, bizarrely vague. Um, and ultimately, it will be up to the judge as to whether his recollection is genuine or tailored to suit his case. Look, you've previously acted for Brittany Higgins in her complaint against Linda Reynolds. She's given emotional evidence over the past two days. She's been accused of inconsistencies. What's your impression of her mm. as a witness? Look, I think she's a compelling witness. Uh, yes, she was emotional and nervous, as I think anybody would be. But I think that she, her answers were clear, even her rebuttal of some of the propositions put to her by Wybrow this afternoon. Um, I think that she made a number of really reasonable concessions about inconsistencies in her accounts, in her account and um, inaccuracies in her evidence, which I think will hold her in good stead. 
We've seen a lot of focus today in the cross-examination by Stephen Wybrow on consistencies. Why is Wybrow mm. focusing on Higgins' inconsistencies in this defamation case? Well, look, I, I think he wants to make a submission that she's an unreliable witness and her account should not be believed. He's focused on a, a number of aspects of her account that at first glance don't really seem that important, like the location of a box of chocolates, for example. Um, but I, I expect that in final submissions he will say that her account should not be believed because of those inconsistencies. Mm. Look, to viewers, to all of us watching it, it seems like the rape trial is being re-prosecuted again. Is this a de facto rape trial and mm. why is this necessary in a defamation case? Well, it's necessary in this case, Shari, because the media are arguing truth. That is, they will prove true that Bruce Lerman raped Brittany Higgins. And so in some respects, it's a de facto rape trial, but there's two important differences. Number one, there's a different standard of proof. So in a criminal trial, you might know that they must prove the charge beyond reasonable doubt. It's a lower standard in a civil case. And in this case, um, you're dealing with a very different opposition. In the criminal trial, Bruce was up against a very under-resourced and under-pressured DPP. And in this case, he's dealing with the best and brightest in the sense that he has a highly resourced media organisation on the one hand and a diligent journalist on the other who um, is working very hard to defeat his claim. All right, Rebecca Giles, thank you so much for joining me and for those insights tonight. Now coming up, the mother of a murdered Israeli boy begs for Australia to wake up and stand up to this rise in anti-Semitism. She joins me right after the break. Welcome back. Tali Kishner's son, Segev, was killed at the Supernova Music Festival massacre on October 7. She's flown to Australia to help fight the anti-Semitism that's taken hold. And she joins me now from a vigil in Sydney. Tali, thank you very much for your time. Thank Look, you very much for having us here. Now, you were at the hotel in Melbourne last night that was stormed by those pro-Palestinian activists. They were throwing bloodied, fake babies, dolls on the floor in front of you and your fellow Israelis. How much of a shock was that for you when you arrived home to the hotel to see the protesters inside? It was extremely shocking because till yesterday uh, we had a lot of meetings. We have a very, very busy schedule and um, at each and every meeting people were sharing so much sympathy love and care and understanding, deep understanding, engagement with um, all our uh, stories, personal grief and, and, you know, it was incredibly shocking. Did it make you feel intimidated and afraid? Personally, me not, but there were uh, people in the delegations who uh, really uh, experienced an extraordinary horrible things during October 7th and this, you know, this um, exhi exhibitions and installations that were brought in the middle of the lobby in the hotel, they just um, caused a, to a very, very painful memories to flash up. Me personally, I was very much deeply insulted by the situation, offended by the situation because it's it's unspeakable, really. I mean, Tully, you're in Australia to campaign against anti-Semitism, to show people what happened to your family, to people like you on October 7. Did this protest last night at your hotel show you just how deep this hatred is, even in Australia? I think so, and even more, it was very fine-tuned that the people, they do not understand what is going on. They don't know what they're talking about. They have no clue about the, they call this conflict of the Jews and Palestinians. It's not about that. They have not clue. How have you been coping on this trip more generally? Because I know that your son Segev always wanted to visit Australia. 
Can you repeat the question once again, please? I was saying, how have you coped emotionally on this visit? Because your son always wanted to visit Australia. Hmm. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to, uh, to just uh, to focus on the very positive things that and, uh, I, I really experience so much love and, uh, and so nice and friendly faces all, uh, all the world where we're going and, and, and I prefer to, to put all these negative and very bad uh, emotions behind me. Mm. On October 7, when did you first know that something was wrong? Did, did you manage to speak to Segev? No, unfortunately not. I even didn't say goodbye to him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because, you know, he went out of our house at 2 a.m. I was already asleep. And when I awoke, he was already killed because he was killed around 8 and 5 minutes in the morning. And, you know, I was texting to the boy who who was not with us anymore. I was texting to my dead boy. Sorry. And, and you know, we started to get news from the WhatsApp and from the television, and it was uncomprehensible what is going on. But I knew only later that when he was really killed. But at this moment, um, we were just looking for him in every and each possible way, by, by all means, by all channels, Telegram, Instagram, Facebook. We just, you know, placed there his photos just, just to get a piece of the information. It, it was terrible. Terrible. Tally, so I can... For more than four days, no, Tali, I can only imagine how difficult this is for you to speak about that traumatic day to the media while you're still dealing with such grief. And we thank you for being here. We thank you for travelling to Australia to try fight the anti-Semitism. And we're all sorry for what you and your fellow Israelis are going through still. So thank you so much for joining us and for speaking to us. Um, and have a, a safe rest thank of your you trip. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Well, Peter Dutton is demanding Anthony Albanese apologise on behalf of his ministers after they accused him of being a defender of pedophiles. Here's the immigration minister making the accusation in question time yesterday. The leader of the opposition intervened as the then Minister for Immigration to allow the convicted pedophile at the centre of the High Court case, NZYQ, to apply for a new visa, instead of seeking to have him removed from Australia. The leader of the opposition instead made a decision that enabled Order. him to stay in this country. The leader of the opposition's personal intervention meant that he was allowed to remain in Australia until the day the High Court made its decision. Order, this members on the ultimately left. is his mess. My left. And Andrew Giles wasn't the only one making that accusation. The opposition, led by the leader of the opposition, come into the parliament and vote to protect pedophiles over children. That's what they did. The Home Affairs Minister has accused Peter Dutton of being a protector of pedophiles. Do you agree with that? Yes. Peter Dutton protected uh, a convicted pedophile, um, and that is a fact. He protected that person from being deported by granting them a visa. Today in parliamentary question time, the opposition leader came out swinging, calling on the Prime Minister to sack his immigration minister. The Minister for Immigration has now released 142 highly dangerous individuals when the High Court's full reasons make clear he was only required to release the applicant NZYQ. The Minister for Immigration lost one of those dangerous criminals for a week, putting Australian lives at risk by undertaking a chaotic and uncontrolled mass release of hardened criminals into our community. He calls on the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs to resign. Yeah. 
or for the Prime Minister to enforce accountability and to sack him. Joining me now to discuss is former Speaker of the House, Bronwyn Bishop and commentator Jason Morrison. Welcome to you both. Hello. Bronwyn, what's the substance behind the opposition's attack on Dutton that he protected pedophiles? They are trying to, to diffuse the fact that the government agreed in the processing of the, in the proceedings in the case uh, that they weren't going to be able to deport uh, the plaintiff. Uh, and that is the basis upon which the High Court made the decision mm. that it was punitive, which is something that is reserved for the judiciary under Chapter 3 of the Constitution. So what Peter Dutton just said then is quite right. The judgment, which didn't come down till the, uh, uh, the day after the first uh, bill was brought in, um, in fact, uh, made the provision that uh, if there was a prospect of them being deported, well, they can stand detention. So, but the important point is this. Under Standing Order 90, mm. the Standing Orders, you may not impute um, motives to a member or group mm -hmm. of members. And quite frankly, uh, yesterday, uh, that should have been ruled, ruled out of order or, or that should have been held to be highly disorderly. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the made and the minister made to withdraw. That happened today mm. because Michael Suka got up and called the point of order. There was pretty much an uproar, but the speaker did call, cause the minister to yeah. um, withdraw those comments. If she had refused, mm. uh, then that's highly disorderly and that means you get chucked out. Yeah. I mean, what we've seen overall... Um, Jason, is that the government is trying to blame Peter Dutton. All this week they've said this is all Peter Dutton's fault. Uh, he now needs to cooperate because this is a matter of national security. Do you think the public buy that message? Uh, about as much as they'd buy Peter Dutton being involved in the conspiracy to, uh, you know, cover up Harold Holt's disappearance. People are not stupid. They, they see this as, as a smokescreen, it's a charade. And what about those two useful idiots that popped up, one on Sky News and uh, the other one that went on the Today Show this morning, both of them repeating this, this damning, horrific allegation outside the parliament? Mm. I mean, to accuse anybody, but particularly someone with Peter Dutton's history... To, of, of covering up for pedophilia. Mm. Um, I mean, a quick... Uh, forget if you know or not about the guy, but a quick Google search will tell you his history as a police officer. That ain't his style. Mm. And his track record is deporting rotten people from Australia, hundreds, thousands of them. Mm. And, and, and these people think this is going to really rock and roll with Australia. And I guess in some respects, look, it's, we're talking about it and not the problem. Yeah. And the problem is there's still hundreds of people who are still at large in the Australian community. Several without ankle bracelets. Yep, yes. and that's your issue. They shouldn't, have, they shouldn't have been released in the first place. But, you know, there's a, another important point to make there is that mm. there is clearly talking points that were put out. And in uh, politics, if there's talking points out, it's the leader's yep. responsibility. Yes. Yep. And Albanese should be making the apology. But once again, he just proves he's the elbow the trot... And all he really likes to do, in his words, is to flight Tories. Mm. There's no thinking about what, what uh, the input is. Yeah. And to hear him today, again, uh, when he was asked about his uh, interaction with uh, President Z, whether or not he raised the question of our servicemen being injured, slippery slide of words, trying mm. try to make you because think that he did. Because clearly he didn't. He, didn't. he obviously yeah. But he won't didn't. say so. But he did, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Brom was spot on. You, no one has said a thing in that parliament or outside of it without clearance of the leader. So Albo the trot is also Albo the smear merchant. And that is, in fact, it's below the office. And, and let's go a step further. It just sort of reflects on the calibre of people that get into Australian politics now, that we have people in really senior jobs who'd say that sort of thing. I mean, that you, you'd go back a, a generation ago in parliamentarians, you didn't see this sort of crap. And it's, we get crap like this because we have crap people in the parliament mm -hmm. and the people repeating these allegations are just exactly that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at another topic. The RBA governor, the new governor, Michelle Bullock, this week in a speech in Hong Kong claimed that Australians actually aren't doing it so tough. Uh, she says that, you know, all of the commentary, the criticism around the 13 interest rate rises we've had so far are all political noise. 
Bronwyn, this is clearly someone who is out of touch with just how much not just families but businesses and big and small businesses are struggling. You ha have to start to ask the question, was she the right one to promote? Because she'd been there for 29 years. Um, she's part of the culture. Maybe that's where she should have stayed. That's a harsh criticism to make. But those comments she made were just so out of touch with what really is happening. It reminds me of the, the comment she made earlier when she said to kill inflation, unemployment needs to go to 4.1%. Yes. Again, clearly out of touch or higher. Mm. So um, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the government, with its so-called changing of the nature of the Reserve Bank mm -hmm. and taking away its own ability to override mm -hmm. the, so the government's ability to override what the Reserve Bank says. Mm -hmm. uh, that's now being chucked by the current... Yeah, by Jim Chalmers. By Jim Chalmers. So I, I think there is a real problem about how much faith you can have. And indeed, I think Terry McCran was quite right when he said the last, usually in, is. the last increase should not have occurred. Right. Uh, and when you saw that the inflation had come down that much, I thought that bore out exactly what Terry McCrane mm. said. Mm. I mean, Jason, I think, broadly speaking, we're not arguing that the RBA shouldn't have raised rates. Inflation's been high, it's had to raise rates. But for the RBA governor to show so little understanding about mm. what the country is going through... Is, is pretty unacceptable. Yeah, or well, they're graph jockeys. I mean, they, they look at the numbers that come in and they look and they say, look, that's that's our reason for doing it. And you look around the members of the Reserve Bank Board, that's even more frightening, how unrepresentative they are of the sectors of the community that really are hurt by the decisions of that board. And it's, it's a top end of town, it's an interest group, lobby group kind of background, and the thing that I find extraordinary about it is that, you know, we had that great charade again, the government mm. telling, as Bronwyn's pointed out, they were going to change this and fix this and bring it into line more. All we've actually found is something that's that even feels even more out of touch. But then, you know, where do they go? I mean, I saw a chart published, the Australian Financial Review had it today, of the impact of price rises. And you look in the top ten things that have gone up most profoundly in the last year... Um, Postage, government caused. Uh, electricity, obvious, government caused. Gas, government mm. caused. Um, tobacco price, government caused. Even insurance. Insurance is going up because mm. just about every state has found a way to a little, little extra just, duty in there as well. That's the thing. It's not just rate rises hurting people. It's all the bills it's as well. It's all the bills. But let's quickly get to another topic. We've only got a minute or so left. Um, Bronwyn, this news that we broke on the show this week about teachers bringing their pro-Palestinian activism into the classroom. What's your response? Absolutely shocking. I mean, what they're asking is the right to proselytise their view and to, again, promote anti-Semitism. I, I find the really mealy-mouthed comments coming out of uh, the mouths of education ministers appalling, yep. just appalling. Mm. And you've got the federal minister saying, oh, I'm advocating in the Cabinet for the Palestinian position because 34% of the people in my electorate are Palestinian mm. I mean, or are, are of Muslim faith. I mean, seriously, how on earth can it be justified? And where are the ministers coming out and saying, this is not on, you try that and you're out? Yeah, mm. it, well, exactly. There's an anti-Semitism crisis and instead of just giving these comments, they should actually be saying, if you are going to try and indoctrinate students yes. against Israel, mm. then you need to face discipline yep. right? because it's in their code the of conduct. Most radically left union that touches regular people are the education unions. And they have been forever and a day. Yeah. And this is why people are ripping their kids out of public education and well, sticking them in private. Well, but not everyone can afford it. It's but very difficult. It's, it's why it's happening. Roman Bishop, Jason yeah. Morrison, thank you so much for your yes. time. And thank you so much for watching this week. I'll see you on Monday at 5 o'clock. And here's Peter Credlin.